there are ways we can we can do things better. You know, uh, something called architecture, well designed buildings or pavilions. You know, we can make it financially viable using the technology, leveraging technology. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. And today I had the fantastic pleasure of speaking with Lee Chun. Uh, so Lee is an award-winning entrepreneur and he's also the founder and CVO of Creod Companies, uh, which is an architectural practice, uh, an AEC tech startup and also a construction company. So Lee spearheaded the finance, design, build and creation of the Creod Pavilion during the London Olympics in the summer of 2012, where he developed a new workflow with advanced technology and manufacturing processes and created the efficient design, engineering and delivery solutions with intrinsic beauty and financial viability. In 2020, Lee formed an AEC tech startup named Creod Integrated Smart Solutions, aka KISS, um, where they developed an integrated design for manufacture um, intelligent automation. Um, they started to use software of Desault Systems, a 3D experience platform which automates and generates detailed design, manufacturing code, a bill of materials, and making meaningful changes in the AEC industry. Lee is a deputy chairman of the City of Westminster Conservative Association Chinese Group, a Conservative West End Committee member, and an international board member of the Creative Industries Federation. He's also incredibly well-dressed and has a sartorial flair, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed sitting down with Lee, um, a, a very business-minded architect who I, I do really think is at the forefront here of um catalyzing and making a lot of change in modern procurement um and in this conversation lee and i discussed the revolution that is potentially awaiting modern procurement and how technology can assist with that we discuss an understanding of the financial lending challenges many developer clients face and how technology from the architect can assist with financial security and certainty uh, and actually help create a very compelling offer from the architect side to the developer. And Lee goes into a lot of detail of how he has borrowed from aerospace technologies to create a new workflow for creating high-performance buildings with cost accuracy and certainty so sit back relax and enjoy lee chun this podcast is produced by business of architecture a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals this episode is sponsored by smart practice business of architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Lee, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Uh, I was outraged a few seconds ago, but I feel so much better now. I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I've been listening to your podcast. For over two years, it's been great. It's very educational and inspiring. Thank you for this. Amazing, amazing. Well, I've been I've been very fascinated by your your career, um, what you've been doing with with Creod, some of the yes. innovations that you've been um, kind of implementing in the business, and kind of creating this very direct relationship between architect and fabrication and construction. Um, and you know we've, we've had a couple of people expounding the miracles of you know design for manufacture and 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 modular construction and and what you're doing in at Creod is kind of taking it almost a step further as well in terms of the kind of design information that you're able to produce and yes. the kind of con contract documentation and yes. there's there's such scope here for really disrupting the workflow and the efficiency and also putting the architect back into a position of of power if yes. you like so it's very exciting to 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 see what you guys are up to so i guess the first question is how did your how did creod begin 
Um, he's, he all started with a curious, curiosity. Uh, you know, I remember when I was um, back to you know, university, a first year student, uh, my tutor offered me a, a position of summer internship. I was I was really surprised when I saw his work, compare his, what he was teaching us at university, he's a part-time tutor, and what he has his own practice, what he's doing in the real world. There's a huge contrast. And it's, uh, what he designs is totally, utterly underwhelming. So I asked him the question, um, so what was, why are we doing, you know, you're doing something so creative at university, but the real world is so boring to leave. This is reality. The clients want something cheaper, simplify the design, and there's nothing left to do at the end, you know. That's why I'm teaching, you know, because the teaching keeps me young, you know, you know, keeps my brain moving. So, so that's why. I, and then that was the first, you know, from this kind of a curiosity and then start paying more attention about the architecture in practice in the real world. So what am I going to be after seven years? Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of, a, and I firmly believe that there must be a solution, you know trying to make this a business work better, you know, a design and deliver architecture, not buildings, you know, yes. uh, in a, in a, you know, make it financially viable. And that's how I started this uh, kind of my subconscious mind, actually, mm-hmm. you know, searching for a new, new way of doing things. And uh, when I finished my part one, I got a job at uh, Fox Apartments and uh, right. discovered this uh, the computational design, SMG, specialist modeling group. And they were developing, they, had, they did develop this tool called Generative Components in partnership with uh, between Forza Partners, Bentley System Software, and I think another company as well. Um, so I had as a hands-on experience in the training, you know, it was a programming C-sharp. It was very new because, you know, you know, back to uni is the hand drawings, you know, and uh, the person who do a big sketch up there was, you know, 2004, it was, wow, it was big, yeah. it was big. And... Uh, Programming, this is something unheard of. And uh, I started doing that. So when I finished my part two, when I started my part two, and uh, I decided to, to, to carry out this research, you know, a parametric computation design and the digital fabrication, which I believe would play a very important role, mm-hmm. um, you know, a game-changing role in the AEC industries. So this is, this is how I started all this, yeah. That's so, so it's very it's it's very interesting that the the world of digital fabrication and has you know it's been around in in academic circles if you like for quite a while now. Yes, and people have been speculating about its possibilities. Why has it taken so long for some of these ideas that are being generated in in a university context to start? seeing or coming into reality with the way that we we build i mean when we when we criticize the construction industry if you like yes yeah. I, I don't know if it was you when last time we spoke was saying it's the second least um you know digitized, digitized. industry after yes. agriculture yes um, that's and, the and mckinsey's and, research the reports in 2017 yeah right and, and and so 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 why 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 has it taken why has it been so slow and and what have you been doing at, at Creo to kind of start to close the gap, if you like? So, yeah. Would you like to hear the story where I did at the pavilion? That's the beginning part. Yeah. That's how yeah, it yeah, started. Please. It's, it's yeah. uh, you know, I'm following this uh, my research, and uh, I I designed the pavilion actually. Hmm. And uh, when I showed this uh, some uh, design concept to my colleagues and friends, and they were very encouraging and said it's impossible. <laughs> And then the challenge it had wasn't only to solve the design problems, but more importantly, to raise the finance as the questions we had was, who's going to finance the job? Who's going to build it? Where should you build it? You know, how you going to, how the whole things work, you know? Uh, but I couldn't answer all the questions, so I decided to give it a go. And then um, I, at that time, I had a full-time job, I remember, and then I started pitching uh, companies. Um, selling this idea, my vision, this idea, the pavilion to be built, you know, during the London Olympics. And, yeah. uh, yeah, after thousands of rejections and failures, I've managed, inspired or brainwashed <laughs> rental companies to believe in my dream or vision. And, uh, and they kindly sponsor their, their product and services. So this, uh, this project was a very uh, unique, it's, um, um, it's a pavilion, uh, three identical elements. You can move them around, creating different exhibition spaces during the day and mm-hmm. night. And the, behind the design, actually, I actually invented a new workflow. It's, uh, so it was built in, in 2012, 10 years ago. It was about, I didn't understand, I didn't know the term 
DFMA, Design for Manufacturing Assembly. Right. And by calling this BFM, Building, I'm sorry, uh, Building Manufacturing Modeling, BMM, yeah. That's the that's key. So that was the work, my, my project is exploring a new workflow, a new technique, using mm-hmm. leveraging, you know, and using high end technology like programming, scripting, and the manufacturing ready 3D model. So that goes to the machines. For example, the, mm-hmm. the timber shell was made by each pavilion, consists of 997 unique pieces. Mm-hmm. You can't cut it like three dimensional angle. It yeah. couldn't, couldn't be done. So we had to program, do the manufacturing, you know, detailed three D model, and then and the convert into the G code. So robotic arm can pick this up, and then we had to de- mm-hmm. had to design the jig as well as hold a piece of timber. And by the way, the I didn't have a manufacturer. It's just a guy who was selling second hand robotic arm. So we had it was a pure R and D experiment, you know, a high risk <laughs> project. So design a jigsaw and hold the timber. We did a, a spindle, you know, the, the drill bit. You had ch- you had to change it, test different speed. If it's mm-hmm. too fast, it splits the timber. If it's too, too slow, uh, it smokes. Or, you know, this is you know, very complex stuff. So everything was done in a way was a paperless from design, engineering, manufacturing, and the assembly. We had the only one drawing. We, I didn't have an iPad back, back in two thousand twelve. Mm. And the shiny Mic Pro is too expensive to bring on site. So we just printed assembly diagram. So the beauty is we, we did all the heavy lifting from design engineering and the manufacture by ro- robotic arms. On the assembly stage, you know, because we, it's very complex, double curvature and all unique pieces. If you put the wrong components in the wrong place or even in the wrong orientation, the yeah. next one just not, it's not going to fit. You imagine each, if each component is one millimeter bigger, 997 mm-hmm. pieces is hot about one meter off. So this is the right. job is that is a, it's just was so very, asked. very fine tolerances that you're working with. Yeah. Very, yeah. It was very challenging because the timber, you moved a lot. It's a learning curve. We left it on the floor overnight. And the next morning I came back and the timber is like banana shape. Like, oh no, <laughs> we had to, we had to leave it somewhere else. We had to flip it and then bend back. And then we lost two days. On, you know, just so many things we didn't know, especially, um, as an architect, you know, as a graduate, postgraduate student, I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have, you know, any construction experience. In a way, I just yeah. did simply didn't have the recipe of success. Just, mm-hmm. just, just, I just made a really bold move, the entrepreneurial, setting the ideas, but in the same time, I had this a new, I had to convince people it's a new workflow. There are mm-hmm. ways we can, we can do things better, you know. Uh, something called architecture, well-designed buildings, or pavilions, you know, we can make it financially viable using the technology, leveraging technology. So that's yeah. that's the kind of um, the very first project, you know. Um, and we built it. We did a wing uh, structural walls, and it was on the final list of uh, British Construction Industry Awards. We lost mm-hmm. the shots. I was gutted. <laughs> uh, it, it was it was a great experience, you know. And another another things I've discovered from the architect in DFMA is the uh, you know. We, we have a problem now, you know, the Brexit and also the, you know, the major labor shortage. But that pavilion we built is, is far more complicated than the box or pitch roofs or called house or apartment yeah. buildings. And then um, these are all non, non-skilled workers. Mm-hmm. And they can, and people say, oh, we don't have the labor, but we, have a, we don't have enough of skilled laborers. Actually, the DFMA, the technology in DFMA can solve this problem. You don't require skilled workers. And we can make the construct, construction industry or ease industry very sexy, you see. Mm-hmm. So people come in, you, you're not builder, you're assembler. Yes. So you come in, put things, put the right component in the right place, you know. So we're now even introducing this uh, little technology with, you know, assembly sequencer, you know, like life. Well, this, this, is, this is an interesting kind of philosophical um, juncture, if you like, of, of building and moving away from building trades and this traditional way of construction to this idea of assembling and yes. buildings become components. And again, I think it was you, you were saying to me last time we spoke about, uh, we look at the, the aerospace industry and they're making far more complicated one-off objects in many, in many cases. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the, the sophistication with which they assemble these things together and the high level of, of yeah. integrity and design and engineering that goes into them and they they get assembled yes and 
and and and what you're kind of starting to put an argument for here is that actually a lot higher quality designed objects can be fabricated and actually be put together with a much lesser trained workforce which That's solves right. two problems in with with one solution yeah exactly and then you can see the young people um, you just need to find the right encouragement they're very good they're very driven they're hungry they want to do well but you just yeah. but if you just do the old the same old method you come in get along with it you know training this and that they're not motivated but if you mm-hmm. Change the way it comes assembly. Even we introduce, we simulate the construction process. Now we can work out, work work with my. I got my own construction company. I'll mention that. I'll talk about it in the in a minute. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can work out the plan to simulate the construction sequence and work out the time scale, how long it takes. And now you can start talking to people. Say, in theory, you can assemble two of you. you can assemble three panels a day under nice weather. If you do faster, I'll pay more. Yeah. Because you can quantify that. So the, you suddenly change the, the psychology, the people more encouraged, you know. So you're not coming here. Because when, you know, you talk about the leadership things, you know, um, giving them a sense of purpose, or, you know, giving them a reason. Uh, the Simon Sinek, they talk about you know, the leadership things. Um, yes. But the reality, it, it's all great, corporate talk, but the reality is most of us, they show up for paychecks. That's the only reason why they're here. So why can't we just make a deal with people? That if you do faster, we'll pay you more. But ultimately, this is part of construction we work out, so we charge £800,000 for labour or the management costs. And then mm-hmm. um, if you do it faster, we'll pay you more. But the reality is we're not giving away more money. It's, it's just the same, same amount of money, but people deliver faster. And then everybody yes. wins in this scenario. So for the for the developer, they can see the benefits because they they on the interest. They're borrowing money from someone, <laughs> you know, uh, to develop this project. And they, they work if you can do it faster, in special commercial development, selling the properties or leasing them, they can get less interest to pay the bank or investors and more mm-hmm. rental income, you know. So they can say you can do two projects in four years. Now you can do three potentially in four years. So and, and then for the contract workers as well, everybody wins. So. It's, it's the workflow and the mindset I'm developing. It's more than just a, a software, which I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So, so how, how have you um, taken this idea from a kind of research and um, design project for a, an experimental pavilion, essentially, yes. and actually now started to... You're, you're building real houses now. You're building real yes. projects with, with yes. real clients. Yes. Um, how, what, what, what was the process from, from this kind of... Yeah. experiment if you like to long and short is yeah it's been difficult because um you know when we build this pavilion i i i was pitching you know this you know to the client developers and contractors it's a new idea new way of doing things you know something mm-hmm. much more efficient better and cheaper and directs the process people like the idea but it didn't they didn't take it Mm-hmm. I can see the reason why because before the before the Brexit, we had you know cheap you know like planting cheap labors from Eastern Europe you know um, yeah not saying they're cheap but you know they're cheaper than here so sure. it's a plenty of work and also the the procurement is a you know the JCT design build subcontract you package them you know you guys take it you know there's a bathroom two hundred bathrooms that's the that's a fee get it done mm-hmm. or you get sued or we don't pay you <laughs> you go bankrupt. So in this, there was no sense of urgency, you know, to doing things better. But since the Brexit, now we have this, uh, the post pandemic, we've got the supply chain disruption. I think, um, we have to work in a new way. We have no choice, to be honest with you. We must work in a new way, a new workflow completely. So this is kind of, uh, you know, for the first few years, it's been very difficult. We couldn't sell anything. And I had to do some contract work for three years. That was quite embarrassing, to be honest with it. Um, we had the specialist skills in computer design, helping a big passive building process in the Middle East. Um, but I didn't give up, really. I've been, you know, in the background, always looking for a reason. Why? Why the industry is not? There's a better way of doing things. Why are people not taking it? It's just, mm-hmm. what, what's the mindset behind it? I've, I've been questioning this. And then I started to look into that. So commercially, it's as well. It's not just about being something better, faster or more efficient. 
And that's not the point. For example, you know, we developed this, uh, this is software and uh, we, you know, we, we've been using different tools like Rhino, Grasshopper, Computation Design, starting with Bentley, with Bentley boys, still using them, and they're generating component parameter design and then move on to the Rhino Grasshopper. Now everybody's using uh, Revit, which I don't see the, I think it's a dead end. And um, so I can, I try so many tools, but and at the end, it's just, this is it's not going to work. You know, it's not, it doesn't answer, you can't compute or cope with the, the, the level of the information. It's more than just a, you know, the pin building information. The information that in the middle is quite vague because I'm talking to you now. It's a piece of information. I draw something on the napkin or drawing packs. There's also information, but they're not digitized, you see. Mm -hmm. The problem with the BIM is the reason I'm saying is that it's a, it's a, it's a dead end because you, you do something in 3D with, some, with a, a level of intelligence, not so intelligent, some intelligence behind it. And, uh, but the thing is, he did his 3D, and you're still issuing 2D drawing packages. So that, I, I just don't understand. It's almost a like one step forward, two steps back. <laughs> yes, yeah, it does. It I makes it. I hadn't, I hadn't actually thought about how obvious that was. Just but... very strange. Do you see what I mean? It's just, yeah. why? And then, you know, because the, the PDFs don't have any intelligence or information. It doesn't tell me how things are manufactured. Mm -hmm. There's no manufacturing code. There's no uh, building materials, bomb. If mm -hmm. somebody take it away, if you had a good QS, maybe they can use a BIM and uh, extract some schedules, get some uh, cost estimation. But for the contractors, they are the main driver because you know they, they decide what to do. They, they're the employee at the end of the day for the delivery stage. So yep. they're still using, they not, they haven't, they haven't changed for, for how long? For 100, 100 years? We're still using mm -hmm. the same old method, you know, to the drawing packages, a communication tool. So it's a very, um, unproductive. But the thing is, that's what they do, really. And they yep. are the, they're the main driver now, it looks like. Not architect doesn't lead the process anymore, which is part of the yep. team. I just, but just employee, you know, get a package done. Thank you, mate. And then if it goes wrong, yeah, you know. So, we can blame them, and so this is the, this is the problem we have at the moment, and um, that's why I started looking into that, developing a tool, and I found it's a the DASO system, you know, the software which is widely used in the uh, aviation, aerospace, defense, and right. automotive industries. So I, I start I started talking to them a long time ago, back in two thousand twelve, and back in the days they they, they, they the company serves being aerospace, multi-million or billion dollar business, you know, revenue. Yeah. So when I said uh, just one man band, boom, hang up. <laughs> just, <laughs> too small, man. It's, it's not even a mini nation, you know, just, it's just, it's just a waste of my time in talking to you. Um, so now they're getting better. It's just like they have a dedicated AEC team that they kind of pushing, they're developing some, you know, uh, some tools for AEC industries. But when I started using that and I realized that um, it was just the beginning of the pandemic, actually. And then... Um, mm -hmm. There are very few people know the Katia software. So if some, somebody dies or ill or sick... And how you know, did you come across this software? That, that, I mean, that's, that's an enormous leap of intelligence in itself is to actually go to a well-established industry and, yes. and to start looking at the ready-made tools rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, which is often what we end up seeing happening. Yeah, I had this debate with my colleagues because we reinventing wheels. We start a new software development company. That's just not that now it's because people have people companies have invested millions of dollars, decades sure. of experience. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So what's the best platform out there? So you know, we, we look I mean, the pioneer of a Katia user is a Gary from Gary. Gary right. Technologies. He's a right. man who he doesn't use CAD or anything like that. He's a very artistic. But he's investing in the company, Gary Technologies, developing tools for um, for his architectural delivery purposes, design delivery purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a complex project that he's done you know, sure. and the, in budget actually, very cheap, was very successful. And, um, but uh, when I, we started this, the Katia software, it's very powerful. You can compute, handle very complex geometry. It's a very, it's different kernel inside behind the engine. Mm -hmm. And um, all I just realized is just not many people know how to use it. There's zero in the AEC industries. You know, but we can find a mechanical engineer from aerospace automotive 
but they don't know, they don't understand buildings. To be friendly, they're not even interested in the, uh, the building design. Just look, compare a car, you know, to a, <laughs> to a building, a box is nothing, you know. So they don't yeah. understand why you guys, what are you guys doing exactly? You know, you know uh, it's so simple <laughs> and they want more money. So it's, it's very um, challenging for me. So that, well, I, had this, I was stuck because I had a, a real project to deliver using the tool. And I had to work with a, a I had to hire consultants from uh, X scary technologies helping us, you know, teaching me. I myself, I, I'm, I'm very good computation. I mean, that, I mean, that in itself is such a risk to like, yeah, to, to yeah. take on a, a completely untested piece of software in the architecture industry, except for like maybe, yeah, as you say, Geary and they're doing, yeah, you know, um, um, Walt Disney. Yeah. concert halls and yes. whatever and it's a totally different scale so you're it's kind of on you to be able to make this piece of software work with a real client yes that was and it, and it took some time yeah. <laughs> to convince yeah to people open mind and clients are very lucky um you know people like willing give us an extra time to work things out and uh, and i realized that um this is not going to work because it's very if i need somebody if somebody leaves my company my job will or, you know, will be limbo, will be jeopardized because you constantly yeah. ring the job agency. Hey, can you find me the cat? Katia user, five years experience. You don't even know what Katia is. So that was the moment <laughs> I realized this is not good. This is very risky. I mean, from a commercial point of view, the software yeah. itself is very expensive. It's 25,000 pounds per year, per, per license per year. Wow. And class training. Um, and then you're talking about, even there's a part two student, you know, they, they just don't have an experience. They, they do sketch up, maybe a bit rhino, but if you want to do the, mm -hmm. the DFMA level, it's just something else. And I thought, this is, this is not going to work. Uh, I'll crash, man, if I carry on doing like this. So I, I started, uh, well, I, unfortunately, I had other projects so I can invest, <laughs> invest and develop the tools. Mm -hmm. I call the Creos, uh Integrated DFMA Intelligent Automation, key gear. So it's still on the, that's all three experience platform. But as, you know, as you have seen that before, just reference services, it generates, yes. it automates and generates a like a steel frame and facade, manufacturing ready. And uh, so for example, like a steel frame system, it generates manufacturing code. Mm -hmm. So you see the 100% detail, a virtual twin, what you see in the real world, or exactly the same on your computer screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the background, you automate shop drawings, which we don't need it, but you just need, legally you need to give some drawings to sign off. But more importantly, is the manufacturing code. So that this is a game changer because um, we changed the procurement method, the procurement routes. So back in the days, you think beam or CAT, whatever you do, is a drawing package specification. Somebody will take it away, a contract take it away, come out with numbers and bidding the job. And now we completely change it. We even introduced the uh, open book contract to a couple of my clients because we generated the, the, the steel frame, like gauge and hot roll steel, it generates a manufacturing code. So you, you can, we can procure to any, any countries in the world as long as they have the accreditation uh, for the steel yeah. work. And then the rest of the SaaS system, it automates manufacturing level, manufacturing drawing, if it's, you know, like the steel panel I showed you before, mm -hmm. and CNC, and you know, cutting tool, tool paths, you know, and shop drawings. So this is a fundamentally change the the way we work. Because so, you know, you know, if you think about the my my question is always is the making ideas. Can ideas be made? And how? You see that the traditional meaning, architecting in the mid sixteenth century in Greek, it meant chief builder and yeah. or master builder. So architects were not only closely involved the design engineering and the, I mean, the, they were not only closely involved, you know, the, the spatial design, but they were more importantly, they were closely involved in the, uh, the construction design, engineering, manufacturing, construction, you know, processes. Mm -hmm. But the thing is we, we are, we have shifted away from that architect. I think so that the Renaissance wasn't at that period. The, arch, the designers want to be, uh, artifacty things you would do something more creative more poetic romantic mm -hmm. and the builders you know you guys just deliver my my yeah, vision you know, do whatever you do it's a split wasn't it yeah. so that's but the thing is a great thing to do but now we can you know the architects can see we had the power we used to be the leader 
of the of the industry and then you know the design delivery now which is a just a fraction a small part of the team like that. Mm. Um, I don't know the existence here sometimes maybe planning I mean the, you can see some contractors can the high offset do delivery you know not this the drawing package is ready so mm. yeah I think this is some so the tool really allows us you know if you see if you go to visit uh, a master carpenter in the workshop it's always even the Renzo Piano's workshop you've got the tools mm -hmm. hand tools this tool makes this and that tool makes that but the tooling is 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 very important you know uh, we talk about digital tool now in the 21st century yeah. so that's why the, the, the software development to me it was very personal i didn't realize the importance so we, you know we had this technology in place we can regain the the power of the you know the chief builder and the master builder with the digital master builder so mm -hmm. we can control from the design and closely collaborate with the engineers and they'll make things work and then everything's manufacturing ready, ready for pricing, not estimation, but quotation, you see, because they have manufacturing it's a, it's a real, It's a real certainty with, with price. Clarity, certainty, transparency. So that's why, that's how we arrive. Instead of using now the design build contract, JCT design build contract, we introduce this open book contract, you see. We work out all these figs and facts. Is how many bricks you're going to need, the cladding panels, whatever the windows, the old quotations. So we, um, so that's you know, what I try to convince to be honest. Before that, I, I try to convince contractors, user technologies, and this and that. They liked it, but uh, whatever. Man. And did, didn't win any project. To be honest, sure. I was I was really disappointed. But you know, my attitude, I'm doer, you know, yeah. and. Uh, I just don't give up really. I just, I, we need to try something. So that's how, you know, because with this confidence, I started my own construction company. Because it's all done really. It's not, it's just. So this, it's, this, is, this is CVO, this is the construction company. Yeah, the Creole construct. Yeah, we're, the, we're our own construction company. Because we already done the, the DFMA. The rest of it just the, uh, you know, assembly really. Get the manufacturing in place, get the certain documents signed off. Mm -hmm. And it's operation really, just like the way we build a pavilion. Now we're building a, we're building a residential project in Western, in, uh, in Hammersmith, right. and we're halfway through. Uh, and then we have a subcontractor doing the basements and we'll be, I'm the principal contractor managing them. And next phase is the phase two we're starting first thing next year, is building the main building. So this is a, it's, it's quite interesting you now using the digital, digital tools, the automation tools. So the notion is, I mean, the, the, digital, the digital tool is not just the, the efficiency or productivity or accuracy. It's really kind of a, it's a game changer, game changer. It you know, changes the way, the mindset, the workflow, and also the procurement and job delivery. So this is something I'm, I'm kind of pushing it. Um, yeah, obviously I, I, I couldn't convince anyone. So let, let's do this ourselves. What could developers do? I can't, what can contractor do? I can't. Let's, let's, let's take the big, bold move and with a calculated risk and do it. Well, why, why do you think, or what, what do you think has been the, the prohibitive mindset from both, you know, from contractor side to perhaps even architect side of the, you know, is, is it because this stuff is so untested and there's such a momentum already in place for the way that we've already done stuff? My, my personal opinion is that the root of disaster for this is the mindset of our industry. You see, for example, like, this is a job, uh, develop whatever the job is, apartment, say, 10 million pounds, evaluation engineering by QS plus contingency. Mm -hmm. But when they invite tender, you know, a contract always price a job less than that, say 7.8, clearly 2.2 less than the, uh, how do you make money? That's a question, yeah. but that's, they enter and they'll, they'll get an award, a contract, and then they start creeping in, you know, the variation orders, boom, 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 this and that, bits by bits, twelve and a half million pounds. That's the end of the story. You see, there's a mindset that the clients, is, their job is um, the risk, because they, they're taking huge response, financial responsibilities. They've got to invest, they've got the banks. You know, if, they, if the bank sends something not right, I want my money back in 20 working days. Basically, you just, right. it'll crush you. They take huge responsibilities. Yeah. They have to be very uh, 
I mean, ultra conservative on the numbers. So they have to, that's why it's the, we all squeeze, you see, with this mindset, because they are the spreadsheet guys, the poker face spreadsheet. They, they mm -hmm. didn't really care about the, um, what technology you use, what math they have built, how quicker, but they want financial certainty. What's, yep. the, what's the best person in your keynote? Who's the most competent person who has to listen to you as a developer? Definitely not the architects, because these guys yeah. just are just crazy bees and flapping around, you know, they'll bankrupt us. So this is, a, but the QS, how do they come up with the numbers? Estimation. It's not quotation, you see. And yeah. always, this, the whole thing is a very, um, very stressful, you see, as a contractor, as a developer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to squeeze everyone to, um, as, as little as possible. So that, that's so interesting. So actually, a lot of you the see that? Yeah. So 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 a lot of the squeezing that's happening yeah. is is you know, part and parcel of part and parcel with the 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 kind of financial conditions that the institutional banks are are loaning money on. Yeah. And they're scrutinizing everything, and exactly, yeah. and, and and hence you need to make it look like it's going to be cheaper. Yeah. And yeah. and so and it's bonkers. It, it is work. very much, man. That's that's <laughs> what I've learned. And maybe I'm wrong, but but just my personal experience. I'm doing the construction work with the investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this unfortunately that's the way it is because the industry, you know, the top of the tree, be above the AEC, is the the finance, legal finance industries. So we're at the bottom of the food chain. You know, yeah. we happen because there's an opportunity. I mean, the developers did a certain amount of uh, feasibility studies. This is a a plot of land, mixed use, a tower. 30 stories, if you hire a good architect, can they, can they make it 35 stories? You know, that kind of uh, push this to the limit to get their planning concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the only reason when we use architects at the moment. And the delivery, is sometimes you just get a cheap, you know, cheap architect. Yeah, it's, uh, the architect is seen as a commodity. We just yeah. get in, fit, fit in this box, yeah. pump, yeah. Out, pump out yeah. the drawings, get us planning yeah. permission, and then sort yeah. off. Yeah, so you have the influence of your big, big architectural firm being around for decades. You've done this and that towers in London. You know, and you have the influence, so we hire a point to, to to get what we want, or even better. Yeah. So this is the uh, so, the, so you see this whole whole thing, the ecosystem. It's mm -hmm. fundamental is the ecosystem. I mean, architects, they, we they're trying to push it. You know, you can see the, the new generation architects they do the design, coding, digital fabrication, but it doesn't really. People just don't care. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. It means nothing. Well, it means something, but. Not too much, really. Mm -hmm. so, so, t so tell me a little bit about some of the houses that you've been working on and, yeah. and the sorts of clients that you're working with and, and what was the process that you've yes. gone through in actually convincing people to take this, what might appear as a risk, because yes. it's, it's, a, it's a totally different way of, of building and procurement. Yes. yes. When we started the job, it's the first job we started, it's a house in Surrey. That, um, in, and then... Uh, that the clients hired two architects from Grand Designs and right. famous on the TV, yeah, obviously. And um, but the problem is they didn't get planning permission. Mm -hmm. That the site is in the conservation area on the green belt. That's that was challenging. So we came along and said, "Yeah, we'd like to help." You know, we, you know, there's so many things are missing. We we can do something a different design. They they look at this. This is very modern. Can we get the planning for that? We did it anyway. So this is with the trust, the confidence. Obviously, so well, this is a technology we have developed, and they're still in the process of developing us as well. And uh, would you like to use that so we can give, we can start using this, so you know, the open book contract. So this is a built material. This is a shopping list. You can buy them yourself, but everything's transparent. And this is our, you know, labor cost ten months to to build this. And then this X Y Z, everything's very clear without a quantity surveyor. You see, that they, they're really open minded and. Um, we started doing that and they're doing a process, you know, this is the problem we're all facing. The design changes, you see, especially, it doesn't matter, the, especially the, I think the pr private clients, they don't understand the level of complexity. If you use, say, the, the, the building, the roof, we made 12 changes on the building. So you work in the traditional way, say the architects can tweak on the Revit, the beam model, mm -hmm. he, he generates drawing packages. But if you make it 12 changes, you link to the fabricator and the contractor, they just can't keep up, you know. They'll charge you more variation order, charge you more money, hefty charges if you, if you do it in the traditional way. But yes. with our technology, actually, you just a click, you know. 
Um, but the problem, the way, if it doesn't work, it won't instantiate, it won't generate mm -hmm. the building systems. So the client will be have a real, we don't have under, we don't have budget for underfloor heating. Can you change the, uh, the roof angle a little bit? And three months later, yeah, we, we can squeeze in hundred thousand pounds of underfloor heating. Can we, so we just use this tool, click, it, it automates and generates a new set of uh, manufacturing code, shop drawings, ready to go. But if you work in the traditional way, it's just not, not possible. Maybe we can yeah. change once or twice, man. Come on, you have to make pick some money. Well, well this is it. This is, we, we see the, uh, you, you're familiar with the McLeamy curve. Um, Patrick McLeamy, who was the CEO of, um, I think it was HOK for quite a okay. while. Okay. Uh, he's got this, he's got this interesting curve uh, called the McLeamy curve, which which kind of okay. shows how the you know the, the the later on in the design process, basically the more expensive it is to make changes. Oh, yeah. That's and right. This yeah. is kind of critical point where you know once you've gone kind of, you're in con construction documentation, and you know an uninformed client will often make changes at construction documentation stage, and now you've got to re coordinate with all the other consultants and it's a lengthy, heavy type yeah. of process. And actually that that process changes, can, you know, the worst case scenario is that changes become too expensive to implement, yeah. but now you yeah. can't actually get to the stage of building it at all because you're, exactly. the design team is kind of, you know, it's just. Yeah, time's run out because the bang is, uh, is uh, keeping an eye closed down you. So you, you just gonna exactly. make, yeah. it's, we need to finish in three months time. So I don't see how it happens. So if you don't, yes. you don't have a right excuse, to justify mm -hmm. that, I want my money back. <laughs> that's that's a that's a problem. So people are like that's why the the, the 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 investors or developers under the huge amount of pressure, you know. And mm -hmm. this is also this, this so many moving parts, you know, when the construction starts, it's beyond everyone's control. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a problem. That's why the, the client trying their best to derail the whole process and yeah. squeeze as much as possible. As a consequence. You know, our industry is about architecture, engineering. We have less and less money to invest in technology, trainings. You see this sequential things, you know? Yeah, it becomes more and more reactive. Ripple effects is kind of, yeah, you know, we have less money. Everything's getting more expensive. And people want more money, they will strike. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you've only used new technology. Back in the days, you had a 2D cat drawing. Any machine, it works on any machines. Now you want to BIM or other 3D program and you buy expensive workstations, more expensive licensing fees. But yeah. does, a, does a client pay me more money for that? Not really, does it? Yeah. So it's very difficult for, for business. Um, I can see this, uh, yeah, I've been through that. That's I took the risk to develop software is to change the workflow, make the process faster. This, start with the faster and more efficient. So we can, at the moment, we can literally eliminate 50% workforce. Mm -hmm. And then in the long run, we can easily eliminate 90% workforce. But I'm not saying that I'm a job killer. So what we, as you know, for the architects, what we're really good at is creativity. We don't want to spend time. Imagine if you do this seven years, creative, flying castles and purple elephants. Now you're doing the, doing the bathroom packages, door schedules, you know. That is just, just, just so brutal, man. It's not what we're trained for. This kind of thing should be done by machines. I call it more than slavery. Not, not mm -hmm. people, but machines should take care of this. You program the way it does that. So we can free ourselves and doing something more innovative, creative. And the directors, company, business owners can spend more time marketing their product services. You see what I mean? Yep. This is the notion. It's a is change the is the business model. If you look at the, um, for example, Coca Cola, it's Coca Cola juice. You only need to fuse the water and gas Coca Cola anywhere. Consistent, isn't it? You try it. This is Coca Cola. Yeah, it's the same. McDonald's as well. They have this uh, management process. You put certain things in certain place, and anybody can make a Big Mac. Well, it takes yeah, exactly the same, and, and, and that's and that's what's interesting is those those sorts of businesses as as demonstrations have have kind of created a set of processes and systems which are very repeatable and produce a very consistent result, yeah. and it's it's a level of relative unskill for people to be able to operate those systems. Yeah, and and what becomes fascinating here is that there's there's a 
there's the potential that the architect is now becoming much more directly interfacing with the end product the end part of construction Mm -hmm. and it's literally like we're getting to a stage where this could be you know you as an architecture design practice you're Mm -hmm. going to be not just designing it but you're going to you're going to have your own construction company that can build and print and manufacture yeah Yeah. and it's relatively you know you've got your own systems in place for training people to put the stuff together yeah exactly yeah i think the 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 the, the secret resource is that we use a method called the capture knowledge because mm-hmm. you know, think about it. Architecture really is. Uh, we're not really, really inventing anything. To be honest, not really. Yeah. Even they do some crazy Zaha stuff. These, you know, have this uh, specialist facade engineering company taking care mm-hmm. of that. It's all been done before. So mm-hmm. what we do is to capture knowledge. We give the parameter. So even you do something, if say the cladding panels, the facade design, and you can change the parameter, different random panels, etc. But the, the principle, whatever cladding system, you know, uh, metal panels or composite panels, is it, it doesn't change. It's the same principle. If you can capture knowledge, program into the system, you click, boom, it's done. So if you look at the RIBA workflow stages, the linear sequential workflow, it, it, it's, it's fine. I mean, but what we can do is, as a, as a tool what we've developed, as a, a business tool, actually, Precisely, is when you do the design. So, for example, um, you, you do concept design stage two, kind of planning application, develop design, the detailed design for, for procurement for construction. But the, the problem with this sometimes, see, with designs, for example, the the job we did, you know, the private house, we designed this in metal panels, and the pandemic hit. Now the steel price, the panels, three hundred percent, two times mm-hmm. more than it was. It literally killed the project. We managed yeah. to start, but which is the client don't have money for this. It wasn't one point two, now it's probably one point eight. Mm-hmm. They just don't have the spare half a million pounds for this. So this yeah. is lessons learned. So because we have this automation tool, so from the concept design, as I demonstrated to you before, system reference services, it click what system boom click, it, it generates the manufacturing level of detail, ready for pricing, quotation. So if we use as a business tool from the day one, the design concept design stage, and we instantiate the, the you know the design intent with the ultimate detail. So it takes you from the early stage two, immediately arrive into stage four. But now before you make a, a planning submission, you can do a carry out cost analysis. So if we proceed, you know, you can see the steel frame is more versatile, the price gone up, it jumps hundred percent every year, this is ten percent every month. Um, Maybe we, could, we, have, we might have considered something uh, more eco-friendly composite panel, which is a less, you know, um, less inflation or material fluctuation. So this is something, you know, more informative for design projects of business, you see. So, so, and so there... with, the, with the mindset, the cost implications. So it's right. like you are the client. I can demonstrate this is our design intent with different, the ultimate goal is a beautiful design, but we, we give you a very tangible figures and facts, how much do they cost? At least the building materials, the building material costs, the rest is the labor, isn't it? That can be managed easily. Is there a limit to what can be fabricated, if you like? Is it, it, it Would we run into a situation where you're um, designing a building and there needs to be a kind of hybrid of traditional construction methods and digital fabrication? Or is the goal to have it like everything digitally fabricated? Uh, not everything. It's some, some, some architectural products, you know, the cladding panels or windows, doors, they probably can buy them or bricks, you know, but we can instantiate the bill of material, the shopping list. How many mm-hmm. bricks do we need exactly? You know, uh, or the brick slip system or the brackets and bolts and then, you know, rigid panels. So it will panelize everything. It gives you a, yeah. a shopping list in a way. So we understand the real cost. If you make mm-hmm. any changes, you can see the re- new reconfiguration and the new yep. cuts, new spreadsheets. So this is the uh, yeah, this is it's quite hybrid. You can yeah, if you do a tower, we can we can do, you know, you can easily model. Let's say this is a kind of a Windows facade window system we're going to use. Mm-hmm. You, you design, make it an engineering template, and you program the way, and you just do the you know geometry form finding, 
you know, subdivide the surfaces and the extension, the, uh, the detailed facade. So the structural one is all automated in the background. Yeah. So, we, so you, can, you can free yourself, again, you free yourself from all this uh, meaningless, super dry <laughs> packages, you know. You can do something more. And with a tangible feedback, you know, this is how mm-hmm. much it costs you. And make a shop around, think, really, for the same what, thing. What's, what, what's so exciting about this as well is, is the potential for, you know, for quite small architectural teams, quite small architectural businesses to be able to be very direct in the output of what they're, of what they're creating yes. and actually there's there's a whole load of different market opportunities here and as as you're saying you know yeah. they're actually addressing the the real structures that control construction i.e yeah. the legal and finance industry yeah. Yeah. and being able to address the problems that that those guys have with lending to developers yeah. um, and being able to offer much more certainty well there you go you've you've you've, you've, you've certainty, a whole yeah. That, that, yeah. that's 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 a, a, a massive opportunity for any yes. developer to be looking into this yes uncertainty is the key for any business really and then this yeah. because of the, the certainty transparency we can we can we look into the you know um, what's it called uh, I just lost my mind uh, what's it called the blockchain finance yes so how much yeah. that's that's a really kind of key question it took me so many years to get my head around so every time you do something, people say, how much? Man, this is architecture. It's not like a, a market. How much is that? It's, mm-hmm. we're not, do you know what I mean? We can't tell yeah. you. You know, the Kensington in Liverpool versus Kensington in, in West London. It's a different world. The Liverpool can buy one pound with one of the abandoned terrace houses in, in Kensington. But here, yeah. 20 million. <laughs> <Pretty cold. laughs> so it's a different thing. You, know? uh, you can't just say how much, really. But now... We're closing the gap, you know, mm-hmm. you know, how much actually very quickly we can generate something very well, tangible again, figures this, and facts. This, this is so interesting. So many, much of the architecture industry has become, or well, many architects have become frustrated at clients asking how much, almost to say, oh, what a silly question. Why are you asking? Or, yeah. you know, we'll often hear an architect say, um, Oh, if a client asks me how much as my service is going to be, or how much is it going to cost, then they're not the right client. Which is a little bit of a it's a, it's a difficult situation because every yeah. client wants to know how much. There's a business agenda exactly, yeah. behind exactly. every single project. Yeah. So as a small as a house like, extension, I just say how much. Yeah, if you've got fifty thousand pounds and then the, the job costs you eighty, you probably yeah, uh, well, we can't afford. You know? We need to know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. we don't want to just go halfway through and we we'll leave on the building side the next couple of years until we save another 30 grand. So people yeah. need certainty. They need to know, really. Uh, but, but unfortunately, we're not trained. And to be frank, we're not really interested as well. <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> that's why we develop a tool. You know, there's a, you, you generate. So this is, a, yeah, okay, that's the, we have all the yeah, pricing exactly. in, the, in the background. You're just, you're just going to be able to have some I certainty. Don't care. Yeah, it's done. And then, so you see, well, now you are building, we're doing something like upside down, build pyramid upside down theory is how much is your budget really? Let's start with that conversation. Say £180 per square foot. What can we achieve? Maybe we should start from there. Like something more, you know, not playing these little games and say this is the budget really, realistically, £180 yeah. plus contingency per square foot, up to £2,000 per square foot. What can we do with this? And we can very quickly using the different systems uh, and say, oh, actually, we can achieve 100, 180, can do that. But if you push a little bit, you know, something a bit better. And, but perhaps, you know, the better materials of the system in the long run, so low maintenance. Don't forget about that as well, you know, operation maintenance. Um, you're better off. You, know, you pay like 10 pounds extra per square foot or 15 pounds. So something, you know, you give some like a tangible stuff. People are... Ah, they understand it rather than you could design tension. You all this uh, eye candies and then they turn out I'm really nervous because this is what's the damage? <laughs> they will speak to the QS, what's the damage? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, this is 220 pounds per square foot. Oh man, that's not good. <laughs> we need to sack the architect so he's not listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Lee, thank you so much. That's the perfect place to conclude the conversation. Really, really fascinating and very, very exciting to hear um, what you've been uh, been doing with, with Creod. And I, I, I absolutely <clears throat> love this innovation of, you know, the architect becoming, you know, back to the leader of the 
construction process of the yes. build process of the design process and technology is really paving the way here for a lot of a, a whole a, you know a renaissance if you like of the industry so thank you very much my pleasure thank you so much for having me take care cheers and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and i make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.